Thank you, Paul, Ken. I'm very flattered by those words. I uh, am myself uh, an opponent of the idea of heroes um, <laughs> on the grounds that uh, there's always the sense that the, the heroes are off doing impossibly great things that the rest of us can't do and therefore, uh, in a way, justifies our not doing anything. It, <laughs> it's a sort of anti-democratic ideal. And uh, so I wish, Ken, you would give my thanks to your friend and uh, tell her that uh, heroes, if they were ever here, are gone. And it's a good thing. I'm very pleased to have been associated for a long time with uh, PSYCHOP. Uh, I must say, uh, when the Skeptical Inquirer arrives, I uh, always take it uh, home from the office and uh, pour through the pages with some sense of delight about what new misunderstandings will be revealed <laughs> in, its, in its pages. I, I don't mean that... that that the articles misunderstand, but they reveal misunderstandings. And uh, I'm, I'm always amazed that there's still another area that I've never thought of. Crop circles. It... <laughs> Aliens have come and made perfect circles and mathematical messages and so on in, in wheat. Who, who would have thought it? Or, or they've come and eviscerated cows. <laughs> On a large scale, systematically. Farmers are furious. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm just always impressed by the depths of inventiveness that the new, the new stories that are debunked in Skeptical Inquirer reveal. But then, on more sober reflection, it seems to me that the stories are uh, fantastically unimaginative. That compared to the stunning, unexpected findings of science across the boards, they have a kind of uh, dreariness to them, a uh, lack of imagination, a uh, human chauvinism to them, a reflection of people who imagine that what pops into their head can be more stunning than what nature has already provided. And so in every case, uh, I always have this, this second thought about that's all they can imagine extraterrestrials doing, making circles in hay. <laughs> I want, in this talk, to cover some aspects of uh, the science, parascience, pseudoscience discussion, and uh, uh, I want to be sure to leave time for, for questions. There are microphones in the aisles. I always find that the question period is by far the most interesting, for me anyway, the most interesting part of the talk, because by and large I've often heard the talk before. <laughs> And so I hope you will uh, feel free to, uh, to uh, ask questions on anything that's, uh, that's on your mind, whether I've mentioned it or not in the talk, in the question period. If I can speak personally for a moment, uh, I, was, I was a child in a time of hope. I grew up when uh, the expectations for science were very high, 30s, 40s. Went to college in the early 50s, got my PhD in 1960. Um, there was uh, a sense of optimism about science and the future. Uh, I dreamt of being able to, to do science. It, uh, it came about, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I was a, a street kid. I mean, not homeless. I had a nice nuclear family, but I spent a lot of time in the streets as kids, as kids did then, 
And I knew everything. I knew every bush and hedge and streetlight and stoop and theater wall for playing Chinese handball and all that. But there was one aspect, for some reason, of that environment that uh, struck me as funny, as different, and that was the stars. Now, even with an early bedtime in winter, you could see stars. Okay, what were they? They weren't like hedges. They were different. And so I asked my friends what they were. And they said, there are lights in the sky, kid. <laughs> well, I could tell there were lights in the sky, but that wasn't an explanation. I mean, what were they? Little electric bulbs on long black wires. So you couldn't see what they were held up by. I mean, what were they? Not only could nobody tell me, but nobody even had the sense that that was an interesting question. They looked at me funny, you know. I asked my parents. I asked my parents' friends. I asked adults I knew. None of them knew. My mother said to me, look, we just got you a library card. Take this card. Get on the streetcar. Go to the New Utrecht branch of the New York Public Library and get out a book and find the answer. That seemed to me a fantastically clever idea. <laughs> and so I did. I went there. I asked the librarian. I was very young. Uh, I can remember looking up uh, for a book on stars. She said, sure. Was gone a few minutes, brought one back, gave it to me. Eagerly, I sat down, opened the pages, and it was about uh, Veronica Lake. And <laughs> Gable. And, and so I went back and explained that it was not easy for me to do, that uh, that wasn't what I had in mind at all, that I meant like real stars. And she thought this was funny, which I, and I felt it humiliating. But anyway, she went and got the right kind of book. And I took that and opened it and slowly turned the pages until I came upon the answer. It was in there. It was stunning. The answer was that the sun was a star, except very far away. The stars were suns. If you were close to them, they would look just like our, our sun. And I remember I tried to imagine how far away from the sun you'd have to be for it to be as dim as a star. And I didn't know the inverse square law of light propagation. I had not the ghost of a chance of figuring it out. But it was clear to me that you'd have to be very far away. <laughs> Farther away probably than New Jersey. <laughs> and the idea of, of a universe vast beyond imagining swept over me. And uh, it stayed with me ever since. It was, it was an exhilarating feeling, a sense, which I later in life recognized, a sense of awe. And when later on, it took me several years to, to find this, I realized that we were on a planet, little, non-self-luminous, going around our star. And so all those other stars might have planets going around them, and if planets then life, intelligence, Brooklyn's, who knew? <laughs> the diversity of those possible worlds, they didn't have to be exactly like, like ours, I was sure of it. it. Seemed to be the most stunning thing to, to study. And I didn't realize that you could be a professional scientist that had the idea that you'd have to, uh, you know, have to be a, I don't know, salesman. And, and my father said that was better than the manufacturing end of things. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, would, I would do science weekends and evenings. It wasn't until my sophomore year in high school that my high school biology teacher revealed to me that there was such a thing as a professional scientist who got paid to do it. <laughs>